So let's have a look at uh, wireless communications links from a little bit of a different perspective. So if we think about a wireless link, so you have a transmitter, and generally speaking, that transmitter will transmit in every direction. So uh, like with a mobile phone tower or with a Wi-Fi access point, you, know, you can be kind of almost you know, anywhere around it within the range uh, and receive those communications. So it is naturally what we call a point to multi-point communications uh, mode. So that means it's from one point, the transmitter, to multi-point. So there's multiple places where you can receive that signal uh, around there. So communications uh, between clients is usually routed via base station. So uh, in Wi-Fi, this is normally the case, although there is an important exception. There is an ad hoc mode to Wi-Fi uh, that's not very much used uh, these days. But again, for some of our work in disaster area communications, we actually made software, the serval mesh, uh, that lets phones communicate over short distances uh, with one another directly uh, using Wi-Fi because precisely the, the infrastructure may be destroyed. Um, but this is not uh, not the usual use case of it. Uh, and for cellular networks, of course, again, uh, the phones need to communicate via a base station to, uh, to communicate. And so depending on the particular uh, style of network, uh, there are different uh, levels of mobility uh, that you can use. Uh, so you might have no mobility at all. So the receiver has to be in a fixed location to receive a directional transmission. Um, and that directional transmission may be beam formed uh, where multiple antennas are actually working to focus in a particular direction, or it might be you have a dish actually pointed at you uh, to, uh, uh, to receive in that location. So the, the receiver can't move. Um, or you might have mobility within the range of a single base station. So Bluetooth or simple Wi-Fi networks uh, exhibit this as well. Um, or you might allow mobility between different access points or base stations uh, as newer and more complex Wi-Fi network support. And of course, the mobile phone network, you can, your phone hands off between one cell and the next. And Wi-Fi also can now do this handover uh, kind of function uh, so that you can move around quite freely uh, as you go along. Um, so I mentioned uh, mesh and ad hoc networking just before. So in this kind of network, we are using uh, this kind of broadcast point to multi point natural function of radio transmissions and uh, wireless transmissions in general uh, to do that. So um, technically speaking, a mesh is where every node can connect to every other node at the same time. Um, but it's now quite commonly used really to mean an ad hoc wireless network where you may not have uh, what we for call full connectivity. That is where not every node is directly connected to every other node. Uh, so if we have a look at the, uh, the, the diagram here. Um, this is not a true mesh. Um, it could well be an ad hoc wireless network because for example, this node here at the top doesn't have a direct connection to any of those three nodes at the bottom. Um, also, we've, kind of, we've drawn these directional wireless transmissions in here, uh, but of course it's not really real. Really what it is is that each one is actually transmitting out in a range that can be received by multiple others. But um, you know, they're drawn in just to give you an idea of uh, which pairs of nodes are able to communicate with one another. Um, and it's not uncommon in these kind of mesh or ad hoc networks to have messages relayed uh, from peer to peer to peer. So if this node at the top wants to send a message to the one at the bottom, it might get relayed via this node here on the right, and then from there uh, down to there. Um, much more realistically, uh, in these kind of networks is that the nodes are moving in and out of range of each other quite dynamically. So you often end up with store and forward or delay tolerant networks that don't require there to be an, a live end-to-end -end link in order for it to work. Uh, but rather, uh, you know, the data will get uh, routed or replicated even with smart flooding algorithms so that eventually it can get to the destination node. And again, this is what we do uh, with the serval mesh uh, as well. Okay, um, out of 2.11, Wi-Fi, um, as we've already spoken a little bit about, um, it was kind of designed to be the wireless version of Ethernet. Um, and somewhat ironically, as a result, it tries to hide the broadcast nature uh, of the Wi-Fi, even though the early versions of 802.11, um, sorry, 802.3 Ethernet didn't hide the broadcast nature uh, of the links. Um, so it was designed for use uh, in relatively near range areas. Uh, and 
the you know, the intention of it was to provide um, reliable high speed communications um, despite the complexities that wireless has over uh, fixed uh, media uh, and including also the you know the power efficiency for the clients this is quite important uh, again we actually found with the serval mesh if you have phones in the ad hoc mode talking to each other their batteries might only last an hour to an hour and a half whereas as a wi-fi client they might work for eight or ten hours uh, because they can uh, with the help of the infrastructure as a central tone coordinator uh, they can basically stay asleep most of the time and still be able to communicate with one another uh, via that uh, access point um, and somewhat infamously 80211 attempted to have uh, security now they wanted to have uh, wired equivalent um, privacy so web was the first version and the, the first uh, few iterations of uh, security and wi-fi were not particularly good uh, perhaps because they were rushed through a little bit uh, but it has eventually uh, got quite a bit better um, so the original edo 211 standard of course this has been uh, superseded by b and g and n and um, a and it's moved on quite a lot but the general kind of idea uh, you know is still there so uh, this frequency hopping or uh, orthogonal frequency domain um, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing uh, is used or you can also have uh, direct sequence uh, spread spectrum there's a, a number of uh, options in there and so the original 80211 was up to uh, to 2 megabits uh, then 80211b came out that increased that to 11 megabits uh, and this is both of these are still using the 2.4 gigahertz um, ism band that has this permissive license in most countries and actually caused in fact the license to become permissive in most countries because people wanted wi-fi uh, it was kind of the, the killer use uh, that uh, led to many governments actually liberalizing the um, uh, the rules around that band uh, then 802.11a came along which allowed higher speeds um, using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing uh, in the five gigahertz band where there was a wider band available so they could get higher speed uh, and now there's 802.11g uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz band that does the same kind of trick uh, and as we say there's n and ac and the like that uh, allow uh, for higher speeds again um, so collision avoidance when you've got mobile wireless devices is quite tricky um, so if we think about this diagram here right so node b can exchange uh, frames with a and c but a and c can't exchange frames uh, directly uh, and so this is clearly uh, frustrating uh, whoops if they do want to communicate with one another um, they might try and communicate through b but the trouble is that b can hear a and c so if a and c both listening go, oh there's there's, there's an, you know the, like on ethernet right oh no one's transmitting i'll just transmit now and they both transmit at the same time and b can't you know uh, de-scramble the, the mess that is their collided signals uh, and so this is the hidden sender problem so from the perspective of a and c they are hidden senders from each other uh, but still able to cause interference um, or hidden nodes uh, is the other terminology so uh, right uh, so another problem is the exposed node problem so if b uh, wants to send uh, to a c can tell because b can uh, c can hear b's transmission um but that doesn't mean that c can't transmit to someone else at that point in time who can't hear b's transmission so if we had node d that was off to the side um like in this diagram uh, so um, C can transmit to D while B transmits to A because neither A nor D can hear the transmission from the other that would cause uh, interference and loss of the frame so these are difficult problems to solve uh, in an optimal kind of way uh, and in a fully distributed network uh, where you don't have you know a central coordinated uh, uh, function uh, it's essentially impossible to solve in the uh, the optimal case um, the method that 802.11 uh, 
uh, uses to try to minimize these uh, the impact of these is multiple access with collision avoidance. So the sender and receiver exchange a short control frame before the sender actually transmits any data. And that also lets the other nodes around them know, ah, okay, right, they're going to transmit uh, and they can then take action to avoid colliding. So the sender transmits a request to send frame to the receiver and that includes how long it's going to need the airtime for. And so effectively, it's the length of the data frame to be transmitted. And then the receiver replies with a clear to send. So this implies that the RTS frame has got through. If it hasn't, then you won't get a reply, so it won't transmit. Um, but if it does get the CTS, then A, you know that the receiver is in range and able. And that CTS frame also contains the length um, so that anyone that also can hear the CTS frame knows to shut up for a little while so that C uh, can hear the, um, uh, the frame. Right. Um, the other nice thing with this is that any node that hears the RTS frame but not the CTS frame doesn't have to stop transmitting uh, because it can be confident that if it can't hear the sender who transmitted the CTS, then the transmitter who sent the CTS probably can't hear transmissions from it. This is not strictly guaranteed, um, but in general, uh, it will hold. Uh, and of course, by having the length of the frame uh, in the CTS, this tells everyone that can hear it how long they need to stay off the channel for. Uh, so this provides a considerable advantage uh, in this situation. Um, so could also include an ACK uh, in the, uh, the MACA uh, approach. So in, in this case, the receiver would send an ACK to say that they've sent the frame, um, and then the nodes would wait until they've received the ACK uh, before they start transmitting, assuming because you know, they're waiting until the uh, the channel is assumed to be available again. There are problems, of course, with this. So if more than one node uh, tries to uh, you know to send an RTS at the same time, there will be a collision. Uh, but 802.11 doesn't have intrinsic collision detection, so the senders just have to realise that something has gone wrong because they didn't get the CTS. So they'll just wait a random amount of time and then try again. Um, and again, it uses an exponential backoff algorithm, um, essentially the same as in regular uh, Ethernet. Okay, and we'll come back to this in the next video.